What was Jesus doing on the Sermon on the Mount? He was sitting. Another time, he was, uh, there was a boat, and he went out and sat in the boat because the crowd was pressing against him, and he, uh, he uh, taught from in the boat, sitting in the boat. So I guess if Jesus could sit while he was teaching, I guess if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. I'm going to talk this morning about fretting. Yeah, there's a word we don't use very often. We're going to look at Psalm 37, just the first few verses about fretting. Um, yeah, I, was, I, was, I didn't know if you'd catch that, John. Uh, yeah, daylight savings time. First of March this week. I wish spring would hurry up. I got a couple of pictures here for you. Facebook is kind of fun for getting fun pictures here. So, but here's somebody who was really anxious for spring to come. <laughs> and he had his snow and he went out and he painted flowers all over his snow because he's so anxious for spring to come. Yeah. Another one that I, that, uh, my, my niece sent on the internet or on uh, Facebook. Um, that's an actual icicle. It said it's so cold even the ghosts are freezing. <laughs> And that icicle froze looks like a hand crawling down off of the roof. Well, I, I, got, I, I, have, I have a controversial issue to bring this morning. I have not bounced this past John. In fact, I don't even know if John holds the same position that I do on this controversial issue. Um, this is liable to split the church right in half with this controversial issue. Here it is. What color is the dress? No, no, it's black and blue. <laughs> For you non-internet people, this appeared on the internet, and some people see it as gold and white, and some people see it as white and... No, I got right? Gold and red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But the whole country's been split, and this has been the most tweeted and most Facebooked item ever in the history of the Internet. <laughs> Such an important issue here. <laughs> All right, I have a question for you. Um, what do you worry about? There is a lot out there for us to worry about. Huh? Uh, Internationally and nationally, um, radical Islam and terrorism, um, there had threat, been threats about bombing malls, and there's been extra security at the malls around the United States. Uh, we saw um, Coptic Christians beheaded just a week or so ago, and this, is, this, this can be frightening to think about it. What's going to happen? Um, the economy, uh, you know, we had a few years back that downturn in the economy and people lost their jobs and hence lost their homes and, and um, I put in here national debt. The United States government is trillion, trillion, trillions in debt and somewhere along here we could have an economic collapse. Do you realize that China owns most of the securities that we have out there in debt? Boy, that's something that we could, we could, we could worry about, huh? Uh, war in Ukraine is heating up. They supposedly had a, uh, had a uh, peace uh, initiative and it lasted about I don't even think it lasted 24 hours, and then there were more attacks, and there's been evidence of that uh, Russia is still supplying the rebels, and, um, you know, the Cold War supposedly has ended, but the Cold War is heating up again. Something we could worry about, huh? Not only international things, but how about health issues in our own life? Um, I got bad knees, I pulled a back muscle, uh, you know, those are minor things. Um, there are a lot of people that have health issues. You could develop a debilitating health issue. Your own personal budget, debt that you might be carrying, loss of job, and when you lose your job, you get that monthly mortgage to pay, and 
There are just all kinds of things that we could worry about. Huh? Have I gotten my point across? <laughs> what a depressing sermon this is. Huh? There are all kinds of things that we can worry about, and we often do. Well, we're going to talk about David's answer to worry in our lives. Psalm 37, we're just going to look at the first seven verses, though it goes on uh, much longer. Um, if I was Pastor John, I'd preach on a whole thing and go two and a half hours. In the oh, no, but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'm just going to limit it to the first seven verses. Let's read this out loud. It says, do not fret, David writes, because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like the green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's a well-known verse, huh? Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. And then here's the admonition again. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they Carry out their wicked schemes. Uh, wonderful passage of scripture, admonition against fretting. Let me give you a little background of it. The psalm does start before verse 1. It has those, uh, in the Hebrew, it has those familiar phrase, Lidavid, which indicates that it was one of David's orig original psalms that he wrote. He wrote many of them. Others wrote some of the other psalms, but... Um, this one literally says it is of David. We don't know exactly where it falls in David's life. When I was thinking about this, you remember early in his um, running from Saul when Jonathan just kind of indicated that King Saul, who was going paranoid and was going to chase after David, and David, David left and went out in the wilderness. He was joined by a whole bunch of men. Do you remember what kind of people those were? They were a bunch of complainers. They were people who were in debt. They were people who didn't like the government, you know, and a whole bunch of troublemakers joined him. And I wondered if this was um, when David maybe wrote this psalm to try to talk to those people. But later on in the psalm, verse 25, it says, I was young and now I am old. Wonderful verse. It goes on to talk about that. And I have never seen the Lord forsake any of his of his righteous people. Um, but so it must have obviously been written a little older in David's life. When David was older, um, there was a rebellion of Absalom where David had to flee Jerusalem. Perhaps this was written um, then, and uh, that certainly could have caused a lot of fretting, maybe in David's life or maybe in his uh, people's lives. But we don't know exactly when it was written. An interesting thing about this psalm is it is not a psalm of praise and worship. Many of the psalms are. We just sang that song that had those familiar Hebrew words, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And, and many of the psalms are worshipful psalms, looking at the Lord and praising Him and singing praises to Him. This one is not. Um, it is considered in Jewish tradition to be a maskil. What that means, in fact, that word literally appears on some of the psalms, not on this psalm, but on some of the psalms. The, the Hebrew word maskil means that it was a teaching psalm. It was teaching an important lesson to the listeners of that psalm. And it, you remember, psalms are songs, and so it was, it was sung to them. We have that in our hymns today. Sometimes our hymns are praise and worship hymns. Sometimes our hymns uh, teach us a, the words teach us an important lesson. Well, this one teaches a lesson. A teaching a lesson about fretting over the wicked. Okay? All right, here's my sermon outline. 
It is not a long, convoluted outline with subpoint, subpoint, subpoint. It is a very easy outline for you to take with you. In fact, that's what I'm going to try to encourage you. Can you remember four words? Now, you can do that, huh? You know, if somebody tells you four words, red, green, yellow, and blue. Dan, can you remember red, green, yellow, and blue? Ah, ah, four words, huh? I got four words for you to remember. What is the cure for fretting? Here it is. How to overcome worry. Trust, oh, two of them went. Delight, commit, and wait. Ah, can you remember that? What my goal is for you to be able to walk out of here this morning and say, oh, I remember Pastor Herrick's message. Trust, delight, commit, and wait. Why don't you say that with me? Ready? Trust, delight, commit, and wait. All right, let's get into the psalm a little bit. The problem. The problem is, is worry. Psalm 37, verses 1 and 2, David writes, Do not fret! because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. Notice they had a specific thing to worry about. The unrighteous people seem to be succeeding. Those who would do God's people harm, those who were wicked, they seem to be the ones who were gaining power. They seem to be the ones who were prospering. And David writes, don't worry about it. He says, for like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die. I looked up um, the definition of the word fret in an English dictionary, an online dictionary. I think it was Webster's. Here's what the word says. It is a verb, right? Fret means it action. You are doing something. It literally means be constantly or visibly worried or anxious. Now, you go back to the original Hebrew word here, and it's rather interesting. It literally means to burn or to be aroused. Um, sometimes it is translated as to be angry at. Um, somebody burns with anger, right? So it sometimes is translated that way. But I looked up a, a, a spot on the Internet that had like 20 translations, and there was only one that translated it here as don't be angry. All the rest of them use the word fretting. So I was reading some of the commentaries on that particular word, and the word fret means to be actively worried about something. It goes a step beyond just worry. Um, we can worry on the inside and not show it much on the outside. You know, we can be sitting there, how was your day? You know, I, I get a kick out of that seeing people on Sunday mornings and you come up to them and they say, hey, how you doing? Or how was your week? And people say, great, fine, okay. And it really wasn't, you know. <laughs> they got all kinds of problems in their life and they got all kinds of things. Of course, to be nice, you're not going to all of a sudden dump all your problems on somebody. How are you doing? Well, sit down here. I want to tell you about all my problems. You know, we don't do that, you know. Um, so we keep it on the inside. A lot of times we're worrying on the inside. But when that worry gets to such a point, it begins to show on the outside. Our face looks worried. We might wring our hands. We might pace a little bit. Somebody might say to you, hey, you look, you look kind of down today. What's wrong? They can see it on the outside. That seems to be what this word fretting is talking about. Your worry has broken through that crust that we put on and it's, show, it's leaking to the outside so that people can begin to see your worry on the outside. Um, here they gave a sentence. She fretted about the cost of groceries. Yeah, maybe a widow or maybe a, a single or divorced gal and got some kids at home and going to the grocery store and grocery prices just keep going up and her paycheck doesn't go far enough. She fret, frets about spending so much on groceries. But she's got to feed her kids. Ah, what a wonderful example sentence. <coughs> Fretting. Synonyms. Synonyms of uh, worry. Be anxious. Feel uneasy, be distressed, be upset. All of those are synonyms of that word to fret. 
We are not to fret, David says. Then he gives us the solution. He goes on. He says, you Christians, of course this was Old Testament, you Jewish believers in the one and true God, you should not fret. The psalm gives us the solution to worry, to fretting. Now, if you were to go to the internet, you know, this is a big, this is a big topic. I don't want, I, I, I want to, I don't want to play this topic down because it is a big topic in everybody's life out there. If you were to go to the internet and you type in the word anxiety or worry, you will get thousands, literally thousands. You know how Google brings me. There are 876,000 results from that term that you typed into the internet. Yeah, anxiety. Huh? So there's all kinds of people offering solutions to worry. Here's just a couple of them. Um, tips, this was, this was the title of the page. Tips to managing anxiety and stress. Anxiety and depression organization. The Anxiety Disorders Association of America. There's literally an, a, a huge association um, that has organized to help people with stress in their life. Here's another one. This is from uh, um, WebMD, a, a well-recognized site on the internet. Ten natural depression and anxiety treatments. Natural ones. Don't take all of the drugs to, to stop your anxiety, but there are natural ways to do that. Um, here's another one. This is from the UK. Stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, NHS choices. You can choose what to be anxious about or not. So my point is in showing, oh, there's one more. Here's uh, Dr. Oz, the sane way to beat anxiety and depression. You know, he likes to pick up hot topics on his show. Well, this is just one of those hot topics, how to handle anxiety. And the world has a trouble, has trouble trying to handle anxiety. But for the Christian, our relationship to the Lord, an all-powerful, sovereign Lord who's in control of the universe and in control of all things that are in our life and a Father who loves us, our relationship with Him and our relationship with His Word is the cure to stress and anxiety and worry and fretting in our life. Four steps. Okay, you guys know those four steps already. Ah, oh, you've lost them already. I went on talking, and that was three minutes ago, and you forgot them already. Dan, what was my outline? Yeah, he's cheating. He's looking at his paper. And wait, yeah. <laughs> trust, delight, commit, and wait. Here we are. First one, trust. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pastures. Trust in the Lord. We are to trust in the Lord. Do you ever think about what that word means? Trust in the Lord. Uh, I got a, I know, I got a bad back, but I'm going to try to do this here. John, I wonder if you'll come on up here. Now I want you to face that way. Oh, you're funny. Face that way. <laughs> I want you to fold your arms across your chest. <laughs> fold your arms across your chest. I want you to close your eyes. And remember, your good friend, John Herrick, is, me, <laughs> is standing behind you. And don't want to see you get hurt. Don't want to see your head bounce off of this hard floor. So whenever you are ready, I want... <laughs> I want you, without moving your feet, I just want you to lean. No, no, we won't do that. I won't make you do that. My bad back, we'd both probably go down and we'd both be in real trouble. Of course, you know, you've seen that exercise as a training in trust. But I think it's a good exercise for us to understand how to trust in the Lord. Just let it all go. Trust him to handle it. 
I read, maybe you've heard this illustration before because I've read it before, but there was a, a Wycliffe uh, translator who was translating um, the New Testament for a uh, tribe down in South America. And he had a native who was helping him with the translation. And they were having problems because in, in that, those people's language, they could not come up with a word for the New Testament word faith or believe. And that's a very important word. Um, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Whoever, whosoever believes in him. They couldn't find a word in that language. And then that, uh, that translator just struggled over it and struggled over it with, for a number of weeks. And then one day, his, um, his native helper came in. He was working all day and came in to help him in the evening. And he had been working very hard. And that, and that native translator, he says, Oh, I am so tired. I'm just going to put my full weight on this chair. And that native sat down in that, in that missionary's dining room chair. And the missionary says, what did you say? And he says, well, I'm just going to put my whole weight on this chair. Of course, in his own language. They had a word for that. And the missionary says, hey, there's a good word that we can put for believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just rest our full weight upon him. I think that's a good definition of the word trust. Is that we come to the Lord and we rest our full weight on him. Believing that when I cross my arms and close my eyes and just fall back, the Lord Jesus Christ will be there to take care of the situation. So trust. We have to trust the Lord with it. Why can we trust in God? As believers, we need to be different than the world. I showed you all of the, I showed you a few of the internet sites that everybody's talking about worry and anxiety, but we as believers should be different. Here's why. Number one, God is all-powerful. You know, one of, one of the things that when I went to seminary, John, that was years ago, years ago. Noah just got off the ark, and we went to seminary <laughs> together. But uh, one of the things that seminary likes to do is they like to put great big terms on things, you know. Um, John, you remember Genesis 3.15? Genesis 3.15. You remember what they called that? The Proto-Evangelion. Yeah, that, that, that's the uh, promise of the seed of the woman going to come and crush the Satan's head, you know? So, so they've got to come up with these big terms. Well, we call this omnipotent. There are three attributes of God. Omniscient, omniscience. Omni means all-inclusive. Inclu there's omniscience, omniscience, knowing everything. God knows everything. There is omnipotent, potent, meaning powerful, omnipotent. And then there is omnipresent. Yeah, God's presence is everywhere. Omnipotent. He's all-powerful. That means he is in control when Muslim radicals behead Christians. God is in control when the wicked people begin to, it looks like the wicked people are gaining control and prospering and the righteous people are undergoing persecution and problems. God is in control of the economy of the United States. God is in control of your job situation. God is all-powerful. Secondly, uh, Jeremiah 32, 27, a uh, good verse. Jeremiah, quoting the Lord, says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? That last question, uh, we call that a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a question that you might ask that the answer is obvious. It's, you know, everyone's just going to say, well, and they're going to blurt out the answer. If I were to say, 
Pastor Herrick, is Pastor Herrick handsome? You know, that's kind of a rhetorical question because everyone knows the answer to that, right? Well, this is a rhetorical question. Is anything too hard for me? And then everyone in their mind is thinking, no, there is nothing too hard for the Lord because God is all powerful. Secondly, he is loving. Psalm 25, verse 6 says, Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. His great mercy and love. Sometime read Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul wanted to bring across how much God loved us in Romans chapter 8. And he begins to wax eloquent there about how strong God's love is. He says, nothing is able to separate you from the love of God. Let's see. Let's try some examples. What might be able to separate us from the love of God? Can height? Can you ever go too high that the love of God can't reach there? No. Can depth? No. Can, can anything else in creation? No. Can angels separate you from the love of God? No. And Paul begins to talk about all kinds of things. Nothing, 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 nothing can separate you from the fact that when you received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you became a child of his and he loves you. Now, if you put these two truths together, worry is cured. Something happens that you could worry about. Wait a minute. God's in control. God wants my best. I don't have to worry about it. Now, does that mean no problems will ever come in your life? Does that mean no problems that you could possibly worry about won't come in your life? No. God allows things to come into our life to help build character, to help us, to grow us. But we need not worry about them. God is all-powerful, and God loves you. Quit worry. All right, secondly, we are to trust. Secondly, we are to delight. David goes on, verse 4. He says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I preached just a couple months back about... Um, Psalm 1, his delight, talking about our delight, should be in the law of the Lord, it says there. David uses the word here again, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's rather interesting, I tried to do a, uh, a word study on this word delight. Um, the word comes from a Hebrew word, anag, which means to be happy about. And maybe that definition is even a little bit subdued from what delight really could be. If you look up examples in the Old Testament, remember back, I think Joseph, if I'm remembering the context, Joseph was already sold into Egypt. Jacob and his boys were still dwelling in the land, and there was a Gentile prince who saw one of Jacob's daughters, and he fell in love with her. And he wanted to marry her. And he said to his dad, go to Jacob and ask for her hand for me. And um, David's, uh, um, Joseph's brothers came up with a scheme. And they said to the king, he said, okay, you can marry her. But we as Jews are all circumcised. If you have all of your people circumcised, then... Um, you can, you can marry her. You know, that's just kind of a, re a requirement we have for you to marry her. And they said, oh, fine. And then, of course, you read the story. Remember the end of that story, John? They all circumcised, and while well, they were all sore from the circumcision, uh, Jacob's sons and their servants and stuff all attacked and, and slaughtered them. But that was a real delightful story. Why do I bring that? No. <laughs> The word delight is used there that this prince delighted in Jacob's daughter. I think it was Dinah was the daughter. Jacob, they delighted in her. I think that adds some, some, some light to us about what this word delight. Guys, I want you to think back when you were dating. And you were starting to go with this one particular girl quite steadily. 
and you'd get done with the date and you'd go home and you'd lay there in bed and she was the only thing that you would think about. And you'd get up in the morning and you'd think about, I was going to say, you'd text her, but maybe that was before texting came along. But you'd want to communicate with her. You'd want to see her. She was on your mind all the time. You delighted in her. I think that's a good key in we need to delight in the Lord. He needs to be on our mind. We need to just long for the time when we get together with him again. We need to delight ourselves in the Lord. Rather interesting, there was, a, it was used of a young man delighting in a girlfriend. This was kind of interesting. There are several places in the Old Testament where God delights in us. Isn't that interesting? Faithful servants who are, who are serving him. Um, I preached at, at uh, Pastor Jose's church last week, so I watched, I watched John on the, on the internet about serving in obscurity. And I was thinking about this. God looks down and he sees those faithful servants in his local church just serving faithfully. They don't need to get thanks from people. They don't need to, they don't need praise from men. They just serve the Lord and the Lord looks down. You know what? The Lord smiles when he sees that kind of service. The Lord delights in his people. So we are to delight in the Lord. Trust in him. Delight in him. I think that that word delight if you were to bring it into the New Testament, the word delight does not appear in the New Testament. But I think there is a similar word in the New Testament. I think it is the word rejoice. Remember Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, You believers, rejoice in the Lord. And in case you didn't get it the first time, he says, again, I say rejoice. We are to rejoice in the Lord. Um, yeah, there it is. There was a third century man. This is an actual document that has been found in history. A third century man was anticipating death. He penned these last words to a friend. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. Talk about fretting, huh? But I have discovered in the midst of a quiet, and I have discovered in the midst of it, a quiet and holy people who have learned the great, a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians. And then he said to his friend as he wrote this letter, and I am one of them. He was kind of letting it be known that he had accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He had Gentiles, sinful Gentiles all around him, but as he approached death, he had observed the Christians, and he saw that they had an inner joy that the persecution and the problems they had did not bother them. And it brought him to the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, number three, we are to trust, we are to delight, we are to commit. Verse five and six, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause, like the noonday sun. Now remember, what these people were fretting about, they were fretting because it was the unrighteous, the sinful people that were gaining power, that were being prosperous, and they were fretting about that. And David writes, well, you need to commit your way to the Lord, because once you commit your way to the Lord, he will make your cause come through and shine like the dawn. Commit. What does it mean to commit? Well, commit means to give over to. It means to totally give in a full way. It's rather interesting. 
You know, as you go through the kings, you ever try to go through all of the kings uh, in the Old Testament, the various uh, Second Chronicles and uh, um, Second Kings mostly, has a whole story of all of the kings. But there's always, almost always, a spiritual evaluation of those kings. This king did, did according to his father David. Uh, this king did not follow in the ways of the Lord. There's always a verse like that. There are several kings, two of them that I remember. It says, this king followed the Lord, but not with a whole heart. Isn't that an interesting phrase? But not with a whole heart. You know, when we commit, we need to commit fully to the Lord. I have an illustration here written by Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was a uh, philosopher and theologian in the 18, late 1800s. Um, he talks about, I won't read the whole thing. Let me just tell you the story. There was a fire chief in a town. Of course, back in those days, they didn't have nice fire trucks. When a fire broke out, the horses would pull the fire brigade to the, to the fire. But everyone loved this guy. Uh, he was kind and generous and a happy man, and, and people would bring their kids to the firehouse, and he'd let the kids climb all over the fire wagon and pet the horses, and, and he, everyone in town loved this guy. And Soren Kierkegaard goes on to talk about that, that there was one day a fire, and one of the important buildings in town was burning. And all of the people knew that this faithful fire chief would be coming to put the fire out. And they wanted to help him. So they all gathered around uh, the fire and they wanted to try and put it out. And I didn't know that they had these back in those days. But the story goes that they had their water pistols. And they were trying to put the fire out with their water pistols. And the fire chief was coming with his uh, fire wagon and going with pumping, being able to pump large amounts of water, but he couldn't get through the crowd because the crowd blocked his way because they were standing around this burning building squirting their fire pistols, their water pistols on the fire. So in Kierkegaard, uh, he kind of ends that story about that is the kind of commitment that many of us make as Christians. We try to commit to the Lord with uh, a water pistol rather than with a fire hose. Do you truly, truly commit your way to the Lord? Go to him in prayer. Lord, this is a problem in my life that I find I have been fretting about. Let me, let me just illustrate what we do. We come to the Lord in prayer with a great big bag of concerns and cares and frets. And we come to the Lord and we come before him and we take that big bag and we swing it around and we drop it on the ground there in front of him. We open that bag up and we say, Lord, here's one of the problems that has been coming in my life and I've been, I've been fretting about it. And Lord, I, I'm going to commit this to you. I give it to you, Lord. And we hand it over to the Lord. We look back down in the bag. Oh, Lord, here's a... Here's a little one. This is kind of a little, but it, ha, it's been gnawing at me, and I'm allowing, I'm allowing it in my life, and I'm doing a lot of fretting about it. Lorna, it may seem trivial to you, but I want to give it to you anyway. Here, this is a fretting, a worry, an anxiety in my life. I give it to you. You look back down in that bay. Oh, Lord, here's a big one. This one's causing me all kinds of problem in my life. I don't know how to handle it, so Lord, I commit it to you. And we give it to the Lord. But then, here's where the problem comes. We say, well, thank you, Lord. I appreciate you hearing my prayer, and I've committed all these things to you. And then we take all our worries, and we put them back in our bag, and we take our bag, and we sling it over our shoulder again, and we walk away with it still fretting about all of those problems that we were fretting about before we brought them to the Lord. I hear somebody say, you remember Romans chapter 12, verse 1? Romans 12, verse 1, 
I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the, mercy, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, committing your whole life to the Lord. Somebody has said the problem with a living sacrifice is that it can get up and get off of that altar again. I always thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, we might, we might commit to the Lord all our problems, but then we grab them again and we start worrying and fretting about them. We need to just commit them to the Lord and leave them there. On a recent trip to Haiti, this was in a Leadership Magazine. It's a few years back, but as this guy writes, I heard a Haitian pastor illustrate to his congregation the need for total commitment to Christ. He told a parable. A certain man wanted to sell his house for $2,000. Another man wanted very badly to buy it. But because he was poor, he couldn't afford the full price. After much bargaining, the owner agreed to sell the house for half the original price with just one stipulation. He would retain ownership of one small nail protruding from just above the door. He kept that. That was his. He sold the rest of the house to the person. After several years, the original owner wanted the house back. But the owner was unwilling to sell. So the first owner went out, found a carcass of a dead dog. I, I used this illustration last week at the Spanish church. And I said, the carcass of a dead dog. And the lady who was translating, she couldn't come up with a translation for the word carcass of a dead dog. I said, the dead body of a dog. Huh? He went out. He found a carcass, and he hung it from the single nail that he still owned. You see, he owned that. He had the right to use that nail for whatever he wanted. He hung that dead dog uh, on his nail that hung over the door of the house. Soon the house became unlivable, and the family was forced to sell the house to the owner of the nail. The Haitian pastor concluded, if we leave the devil with even one small peg in our life, he will return to hang his rotting garbage on it, making, us, making it, our life, unfit for Christ's habitation. We need to have total commitment to the Lord. Our lives, our jobs, our families, our help. All of those things that we worry about. Why do we worry about them? We worry about them because we still think they are ours. Uh, talking with uh, some, uh, man, well, I've been enjoying the last couple of weeks with the, the men's study on Saturday mornings and talking about their jobs and things like that. And the thing about a job is if, if you're hired and you're doing your job, you're doing responsibility, the the um, money-making or the success of the company isn't your worry. Now, it could be because if, your com if the company fails, you know, then, then you're out of a job. But you're just doing your part. It's the boss. It's the owner that has to worry about all of those things, right? You just do your job. Well, the Lord is the owner of our life. If he's the owner of our life, if he's the owner of our job, if he's the owner of our family, if he's the owner of our health, we don't have to worry about it. We just go about doing what we're supposed to be doing and leave all of those worries to the Lord because he owns them, because we have committed them to him. All right, lastly, let me see. I've forgotten. Ah, oh, my mind... There are four words to see. One of them is wait. The first three were, the second one was, the third one was, and the last one is wait. That's the hard part. Be still before the Lord, and here it is, wait patiently for him. You know, the Lord is never late. But the Lord seldom is early. <laughs> when I go to some place, uh, I like to get there early. You know, uh, 
Uh, I, I'm always looking at the clock, and my wife, she don't get there early. She, I got to say, she don't get there late, but I'm always worried that we're going to get there late, and I'm always trying to get her to get going, and I, because, because if I get there on time, I feel like I'm late. You know, that's just the way I am. I want to be there early, you know? Well, the Lord seldom is early. In fact, the Lord often waits, and that waiting is good. It's good for us. It teaches us trust. Remember when Lazarus was sick, and word came to Jesus that Lazarus was sick? What did Jesus do? Jesus didn't go, Oh, disciples, we need to hurry up and get to Bethany before Lazarus dies. It says that Jesus waited several days and then left. What was he doing? He was on time. He was on the Lord's time. We need to learn how to wait patiently for the Lord's timing. Lord, I have committed this to you. I remember um, trying to teach my kids to do certain things, you know, and I'd give it to them and let them start doing it. And, of course, they could never do it as good as what I had been doing. I'm an adult, and I'd done it many times, and I knew exactly how to do it. And so I'd, I'd, I'd give it to them, and then they weren't doing it right. And so I'd, oh, let me just do it. And I'd take it right away from them again. I think we do that with the Lord sometimes. We commit our frettings to the Lord, and then we think, well, Lord, you're not doing it right. Give it back. Give it back here. I want to handle it. I want to worry about it. Let me do it. David says, don't do that. You've trusted in him. Your mind is focused on him. You delight in him. You have committed this thing that you could worry about to the Lord. Leave it there and wait for the Lord's timing. G. Campbell Morgan writes, Waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means, first, activity under command. Second, readiness for any new command that may come. And third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. Lord, here I am waiting. I'm not fretting anymore. I'm just waiting for you. Well, okay. We all have worries, frettings in our lives. We need to... Oh, I've said here, this is what I've said here. If we have worry in our life, it will rob you of joy. It will stunt your spiritual walk with God. We need to trust, we need to delight, we need to commit, and we need to rest. Um, remember a few years ago when um, the, J, the WWJD bracelets were popular? They had the little rubber bracelets, and they would have WWJD on them. Of course, everyone knew what that meant. But what it was for, it was you'd wear the bracelet, and then you'd get into a circumstance when you, you, didn't, you weren't sure what you were supposed to do, and then you'd glance down and you'd see your WWJD bracelet, and you'd say, oh, okay, I can ask myself, what would Jesus do in this situation? Remember, I thought it was kind of a corny thing, but it was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was there. I want us to make a bracelet. I want us to have a bracelet that goes with us through this week in particular. And instead of WWJD on our bracelet, I want TDCW. What does that stand for? Trust, delight, commit, and wait. Take that with you this week. Be reminded of that. And when you start to fret, when you start to worry, when you start to allow those things to creep in your life, you can just stop and say, no, wait a minute. I need to trust God. I need to delight in Him. I need to commit this to Him. And then just allow Him in His time to work it out. Our life will be filled with much more joy instead of fretting. Let's bow in prayer.